So the standard of care, if you think about what the standard of care, we came up with something that was supposed to be something for medicine, right? The standard of care, right? What would your colleague do in the same situation? Unfortunately, our standard of care in medicine got pretty much piggybacked with the legal system. So now it's based on the legal system actually uses this to stand up the standard of care for what we do. So basically, it's more of a legal term than is a medical term. So they're going to see what we're doing. Are you doing what any other person within the same situation? And then see what you would do in the same situation. So obviously, the most important thing the faculty has ever says is, are we harming patients? Did anybody harm a patient in this room? Do you feel like you guys have harmed anybody? Probably not. I mean, I don't hear too many adverse reactions or complications or things like that. So I think we're doing a lot of good. So that's the first thing you want to answer. So today I want to talk about my complicated case that walks in. I was probably two years into practice and I've been working with somebody that temporarily just for about a year or two and he comes out of the room like he saw a ghost. And he says, can you go see a patient in room one and see if you can help him? I said, okay, I don't know what he's seen. 50 years, he says he's seen everything. So I said, let me go in and see this. And I didn't know at the time what this was. I'll explain to you how we got to this diagnosis. But when I walked in, you know, you try to keep a, a poker face and you say, I've never seen anything like this, right? So, yeah. I mean, and then you get to these, you call it pathologies, you start doing your homework and all that. But I'll explain to you why this does not look like the regular pathology. And this is not what it was probably before I got to see her. So a little background. Um, I'm from Miami. There's no disclosures. I practice in South Miami. And basically, everything I'm going to tell you is just basically anything I have knowledge with, I'd like to share with you guys. I am not promoted by any company, so that I won't be favoring one product or something else. So basically, Olmstead syndrome is very rare. I mean, it's only 73 cases. It was diagnosed, uh, and everybody has to put their name when they find something for the first time. So Olmstead in 1927 was the first person to actually uh, define this. And if you look at the, the 73 cases, it's very rare in females. It's mostly prominent in males. And you know, there's only 59 reports in the literature, literature that they researched in 2014, and it's very highly uh, related to this gene here, which we're gonna go into. But it really starts at birth, in early childhood. So also in 1927, a little trivia here, but if you guys look, Calvin Coolidge was our president. For women, high heels were in style. Wingtips came in, slid back here. Lindbergh went from New York to Paris, nonstop. You can imagine that was scary. Who wants to go with him on a first time trip nonstop to Paris from New York? And the salary was about $5,000, and Babe Ruth was making 70. So he was doing well, right? And the first car you can probably purchase was a Ford, right there for $480. So 1927, uh, it was interesting, but this was probably not as popular. And then if you look at Olmstead syndrome, it's a slow progression type disease. It has a lot of disabling manifestations, which we'll show you in a little bit. And basically, pain. Pain is the really what we deal with a lot, whether it's you know, this condition or anything in, in medicine. We deal with a lot of patients that come in with pain. So, you know, topicals, surgery has failed. Most of them lead to amputations. They've tried surgery three times, and all of them wind up with either bilateral amputations by the time they're teenagers, or they wind up, if they get it to 30 or 40, they had enough, and they both just want amputations. They just can't deal with the pain. And that's what you see if you look at the literature. Um, most people just say, I had enough. I just don't want to deal with this. Cut my legs off. So if you look up here, you know, there's, there's all these clinical things. And if you look at this and you call the pathologist, the first thing he's going to tell you is trauma plantar keratosis. There's an encyclopedia work, so they're not going to guide you. It's going to be very difficult for you to say, hey, I see this and I see that. You can send them pictures, biops. And we'll, and we'll tell you why it's difficult to diagnose this in your clinic. So whether it's Olmstead syndrome or some form of trauma plantar keratosis, you might see something very related, and hopefully we can treat that. So we just can't say we can't help you. So technically, you know, the nails get dystrophic, everything, digital constraction. If you look here, I mean, this is how thick, um, one of these are three sisters that all have it. So um, it is highly related to familial sometimes, but sometimes only one person in the family has it. So that's not even a good way to work up a case. And then other rare findings you can see here, this is actually probably 74, 
And the case I have is probably 74, 75 in the world. But this case, I'll show you, but this is a girl that was 10 years old out of Georgia, and every six months they just debride her foot, but it comes back to this. So um, you can imagine walking around like this. I mean, you can see how thick these can become, these plaques and these leads. But, you know, interesting to say, our, my patient, when she walked in, it had a rare form, because this is a rare form of findings. You know, hearing loss, you know, the teeth. But right here, laxity, I mean, I kid you not, when I had to stay non-weight bearing, she actually walked in one day with her foot wrapped around her neck. And I kid you not, she walked in, I paused, and I said, wait a second, I got a picture of this. Mm -hmm. I said, I'm at non-weight bearing, I thought, you get a device, wheelchair, whatever you want. But she walked in and said, I don't need anything else. And she was crutching along with one foot over her head. Wow. So they are super flexible. This is not your trouble, you know, joint laxity. I mean, this is super joint laxity which is a rare find. <laughs> so, you know, working up this case, I mean, you know, she came to me at, when she was 19 years old, right? And the most important thing you want to remember if you're going to ever come across something like this, they're symmetrical mutations. That means you'll see this exactly bilateral, and this is what Olmsted noticed when he diagnosed this case. And then this is a form that you'll see these lesions about two or three millimeters thick, and there's no past medical history with her, and she was also considering bilateral uh, amputations when she came in. So, I mean, it was a difficult situation for her, and she was at her ends meet to find out what she can do. And then, I want you guys to envision something now. I mean, this girl, literally, her first thing that happened here, she was walking home in ballet shoes from an event in her country, in Honduras, and developed blisters, goes home, Typical thing mom would do, land safe, try to clean it. She winds up getting blisters. All of a sudden, calluses start to form. Mom starts getting worried, they start trying creams, they start doing things. But over the years, you know, she's trying to figure out, she thinks it's her fault. So you imagine, you're dealing with now, the mom thinks that she caused this condition because she land the blisters. And the other case I showed you out of Georgia, that started from a diaper rash. And these lesions started on your foot and the hands, and they were symmetrical. So you can imagine a simple thing can give you a trigger to see, show you that there's something serious coming, which we don't know, and especially at birth or childhood, this actually develops into teenager. But if you want to think about this, I mean, this patient, for 14 years, think about your childhood. You guys have probably had a normal childhood, right? You can run after somebody. You can play with your friends. But if you think about it, from four years old to about 18, 19, she had to walk on her knees in school with knee pads, wheelchairs, I mean, she did not have the same child. So you can imagine the, the challenges for her mentally, socially. People didn't want to associate with her, other people did. So it's a, it also has other effects. And, and that's the thing. And then most times she didn't even have the facial lesions. You would see symmetrical orifice lesions across the lips. You'll see something within the eyes, but, but they're bilateral. So, you know, they had the means and they traveled. I mean, when I heard their history, they went to see 20 doctors, at least, and, and they went everywhere. I mean, Beverly Hills to Boston to Utah to Europe, you know, South America, back to Miami, and, and they're just, all 20 doctors were just, you know, nobody was trying to get them. But this is the case here, what I was trying to tell you. This part right here is that right there. If you guys do any, or have anybody that does reconstruction of wounds, is uh, sometimes you get grafts from the thigh and you transplant them somewhere in the body. The problem is hands and feet, the palm of plantar keratosis, the skin is super thick. So when you see this, this is an atrophic graft. So in this sense, there was a plastic or oral plastic surgeon that tried to do this to help her out. So they took off that callus, put on thigh grafts, and now you got to heal from two areas. So she was in pain here and pain down the foot, but this made her condition worse. She cannot walk. When that happened, that was probably um, 14 years old, and she was uh, unable to walk, so that made it even worse because they're atrophic grass. So you thinned out the area, and now you got more pain. So the pain receptors in her foot, I mean, she was in agony. So, I mean, they tried to give her pain medications, kept trying to just treat the pain, but she could not walk. So it actually debilitated her even more. And this staining, by the way, is, think about it, when you cut and you put a graft on, you bleed a lot. So you get a hemocytorin deposit, which is iron and it stains the skin. So when you get that, it makes it look even worse. So when doctors were looking at this, they were trying to diagnose this with a, as a condition with this and this, and figuring out what this was. 
even myself, I didn't know at the time, you know, what I was dealing with. So I had to break it down. And just because of her history, these are graphs. I figured if you do wound care or surgery, you know that these graphs um, can take on this appearance. And I told her I was going to do a biopsy of this area in a couple areas, and she was disappointed because the biopsies never showed what she had. So technically, um, you have to break this down. And the only reason why I was able to consider treatment for her is I knew that this was just atrophic graphs. This is hyperkeratosis, palmoplanar keratosis, and, and we can probably try to do something for her. But this project here, the Perionica congenital project, she's been only for 14 years and she's on a, a list to see if she has a treatment. So they're, they're kind of have a bunch of people that are trying to treat it. And this is a very rare, ultra rare condition that people would actually have, you know, the same manifestation, so it mimics it very closely. So um, she's hoping that they're going to give her an answer. And, you know, they tried topicals and orals and, and it didn't work. So if you look up close, you know, appreciate some of this graph, but you can see what these kind of plaques can build up like. So they're just maintaining this. This is the other foot, and this is just maintaining these plaques. And the worst thing is she thinks she has an infection because underneath this, she had white discharge appearance and it did smell like an infection. Cold treatment. And the final clue before I decided to try to treat her was they came back as inclusion cysts. So if the skin can't shed, it gets trapped behind the keratotic tissue. So what do you see behind it? You start to see, you know, these cysts that actually smell foul. And you think it's an infection. So it comes back as no infection, just epithelial uh, cells and screen cells, and there was nothing uh, malignant or nothing that was uh, infection. So she, it was a relief to tell her that you don't have an infection. She always thought she had an infection, that's why she also wanted to take off her legs. So technically, the pathology report, it says it. You know, nature of a graph with hyperkeratosis. And these cysts that we just talked about, and these are the conditions they thought it might be. So they said, I don't know what it is, but it could be lunathos, it could be hyperkeratosis, it could be a lot of other things. So hyperkeratosis and atrophic graphs, that's what you have to go off. So what do you do? Orals, topicals, that's the standard of care, right? So that's what most people would do in the same situation. They would not attempt anything because surgery has failed, which is this cross in the literature that all three will either want it with amputations later on. So it's actually shunted in the community not to do surgery. So I want to ask this question and just stop here for a second. Is what do we do in our top five for pain? Well, it doesn't matter what we're treating, right? Does this sound familiar? We go down here, we go cortisone shots, cortisone pills, NSAIDs, muscle relaxants, physical therapy, and sometimes you have no other choice but surgery. But this is why. You see that right there? Are we starting to treat everybody like that? Do you ever notice your colleagues, everybody's going down this route? And the more you see it, and the more you see it. I broke my ankle 30 years ago, and the treatment was the same. Nobody wants to give you anything different because that's what they're going to do. So are we just practicing protective medicine, or are we trying to help patients? Or are we just trying to treat a symptom, not the patient? So obviously, this is a very standard of care, right? For pain. So I had no other choice. I said, you know, we have to try to help her out. And just saying that she had some relief. But the game plan was do a debridement. This is one year after I saw her. Xenografts, which they're not, you guys probably have some experience with xenografts with injections or heard of xenograft injections. This is going to be more of the application for a surgical repair with xenografts. And you got to think about this. What I just said before, these grafts are too thin before. So the key is you have to think about the structure of the tissue that you're working with, whether you're, you're doing surgery or not, or you're trying to do a treatment. Is, what I had to think about is, if you're going to reconstruct somebody, they said, where did you get this training from when I had my residence? They were, they were sweating next to me. And I said, guys, you have to think about this. If your patients had a, burnt their feet off completely, or had a burn injury, you have to reconstruct. They have a necrotizing fasciitis. You debris down to the bone if you have to, and then you reconstruct. You're trying to save a limb. If she's going to go for amputations, I said, let me try. So am I doing something wrong? Did I harm the patient? No, I'm trying to be her last defense before she loses her legs. Yeah, not a lot of people are saying there's nice prosthetics out there. But that's the easy way out, right? So, and it's also legally a safe way to just say, hey, I want to do it. Go ahead and take your legs. So, did you give them a chance? No. So, the thing is, the graphs have to be thinking about, I've done a couple of rotations with, you know, cancer, reconstruction of the breast, and then when you do hernia graphs, and you, when you're doing rotations, you realize that the same graph can come in thicker sizes. More collagen, Thicker shear, reduce force. So what does your foot have to do? 
ground force, right? Shear, rubbing, it's pressure, tolerating pressures all day. So you have to think build up college. So why did I not pick autograph or allographs? And we'll go into that in a minute. And then the back treatment is a machine that will keep compressing the graft, helping it heal. So you're trying to get the skin to reconstruct, but then you have to stay protection, right? After you do all this work, what if she breaks down again? What if she doesn't heal properly? So you gotta protect the area. So technically, full thickness graft, and I apologize if this messes with anybody's breakfast, but you know, I have to show you the depth that we have to come into. So if you think about it, you gotta get in that layer right where the adipose tissue is still there. But you can see what these are like. These are here, and this is why she has so much pain. She's got that adhesion pulling the skin into her adipose tissue, so there's not even flexibility in the skin. So you can think about this, there's no way that we're gonna be able to treat this if you don't get these out. So remove the skin, preserve the fat. So you can see what this is like. If you guys look at this, this looks like a leather flap, right? And it felt like it. I can tell you from experience, because I was there, I was pulling that up, and it does feel like a leather belt. I mean, that's the best way to explain when you guys don't get to do surgery, this is a good way to remember this. And I mean, I can kid you not, it did feel like a leather strap. So you can imagine this being on the bottom of your foot. And you can see what the HO for graft does here, right here, it stays right on that tissue. So that it became stuck to the, the adipose tissue. So it wasn't really inflexible, it wasn't doing anything. And you can see right here, this hard tissue is what we're talking about. This is all in the, the skin in the adipose area. And these are inclusion cysts that were becoming scarred and hardened, and they felt like rocks in the foot, so you can't walk on them. So technically, after, like I said, this is a leather strap, this is, we took about six, centimeters off the bottom of her foot. And then, and close, you can play that. This is just to show you what the breathing is, but this is a VersaJet, so this is like a water bath, like a water pick, and it actually debris but preserves your fat tissue. So it's a great way after you take all these nodules out, and I think this is just a video, I don't know if that's able to play there, but. Tricky curse. And this is also just a fat pad here and the weight bearing surface. That's all it's here. So that's ideal for the grafting because when you put the weight on this and it works, she'll have pressure that covers the adipose tissue. Plus, the collagen on the top of it. With these parts, it doesn't matter as much. You see, there's a fast But we'll try to talk about everything. Okay, so this is the fat pad. And this is what she's doing. 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 Grab the later give us some depth, maybe a couple of stage grabs. So you guys can see here, as we're doing this, we're getting some nice vasodilation, some bleeding. And if you've ever been in an OR or a setting, I apologize for the muffled sound. You've got a mask on your face and you're trying to talk like this, so if you guys understood, what I was trying to say was we're trying to preserve the fat pad. And if we can preserve the fat pad, get some angiogenesis in there, and then from really blood to stressing, we can probably get this to here and start healing. So technically, this is just uh, another video that shows when we start reconstructing these grafts. These are those bovine grafts that are 30 times stronger. And the reason why we do it, you can see when we're suturing it in, you can see what it's gonna do. It's gonna build a better scaphoid for pressure. And, and if you're gonna walk and shear and force so you don't break down. But these take several grafts, but when you're in Miami, you gotta have the little salsa merengue going in the OR. So, I always say happy OR staff makes a happy OR. So, some people don't like music. I have to have music when I work. So, I let them pick and they said salsa was, and I said, here we go. Welcome to Miami. <laughs> yeah. So, this looks painful, but it's not painful. Uh, patients under anesthesia, we give her a little bit of blocks and all that. So, so if this disease has some ischemic components in it, I mean, is it a part of pathology, ischemia, uh, vascular occlusion, you said, right? I'm sorry? You, is, is this condition has uh, vascular occlusion, uh, ischemia. It, it has, she pathology. has, she still has good circulation the whole time. So she never, I mean, actually when we do a clinical exam, she has, but she has a lot of adhesions and there's not good blood flow to the tissue, as you can see from the previous slides that those inclusion cysts are pretty much adhering the skin, so you don't have great perfusion to keep regenerating like you're normally you every two to weeks. Do topical nitroglycerin? It's no, a I don't. It's a medication and it opens up the blood vessels and yeah. it's also help to 
So this is, they're using it for um, those plastic surgeons when they have problems with their grafting, they're not getting off of blood, they do topical microdosing as part of the treatment. Yeah, and I say with all these new things, I mean, obviously this is going back uh, from today, 10 years ago. So you can imagine trying to do this without the knowledge we have today. This is almost a decade. So right. these new things that we're coming up with, that's where we're coming down to. Eight years later, I can show you how we incorporated regenerative medicine. That's why I just want to bring in this case. But that's, that's important. Right. Okay. So the back treatment, this is great technology back then. Oh, yeah. So the back treatment acts like a budget stress. If you see all the bleeding that happens after we release the tourniquet, if she bleeds a lot, the hematomas will lift up the graft so we use this instead of a bunch of stressing, which helps you know, reduce bacteria, stimulate the wound edges, and it actually has really good graft incorporation. So again, treating burn patients and wound care patients gives you a little bit of background to why would you pick this device to help with your surgery. So unfortunately, you had to do it surgery. This is 10 years ago, and it worked really good. I mean, you can see this is the right foot. We did the left foot just now, but same thing. You get this little flat-looking leather, but. This is what happens when the graft starts to incorporate healthy. This is actually good tissue. So don't you love it when a doctor walks in and says, you look awesome. <laughs> this looks beautiful. And the patient looks at you, what are you talking about? I look like um, my foot's going to fall off. And you see nice vascular buds and you're excited. And they're saying, why are you excited as a doctor or surgeon? And he knows what I'm talking about. Right? And we walk in and we, and we say, you, this is awesome. We see what we love and we get excited. And they don't get it. When we get excited, that's good news. Right? So, uh, but the patient looks like they'd be worried. So eight months later, guess what? Remember her left foot? So, and this is her right foot. And, and it took her about exactly two years that she's walking after this, and she actually had done at the hospital, did an article in the Miami Herald on her. And I said, make it about her, I don't care. They made a little plug, okay, great, but it was her story. Her thing was, I can finally wear Sam. I can have a normal life. I'm walking. This is two years after, but at a year we had her close, you know, with new skin grafts. The question was, how they going to hold up? So, if you look at why we picked up the Xenia grafts, if you look at this, whether you guys are taking the test or not, it's always going to be, remember these kind of things here, and it's always going to be very similar. These always cross over to different products. But collagen wanted to, here's the key why we picked a xenograft over an allograft. Why not use cadaver? Why not use something else? because it's 30 times stronger. Bovine, think about it, a cow. Is a cow's skin gonna be stronger than our skin? I mean, if you wanna keep it simple, but if you wanna go into the sciences, it's 30 times stronger. They've tested it, the collagen is. So I had my colleagues always come up and asking me, why don't you use this product? They were trying to help the reps out. And I said, I, don't, I can't treat your reps, I can't, I gotta treat the patient. And I wouldn't do this for myself. And I would put a bovine or a xenograft over anything else. I did this for my Achilles tendon repair over the years, I've done it. And I would put always both on because when you want the strongest thing, but again, we have to have the right product for the right tool. So basically, we use this in burn patients, right? I just said that early on in deep wounds, like you're down to the bone. So these are proven to heal in different scenarios. So you've got to use, sometimes you're thinking how to say, if I can use this in this situation, why can't I use it in this situation? And that happens in regenerative medicine too, right? So if we start seeing results, we start saying, well, you start to think outside of the box. If it's working like this, well, why wouldn't it work for this? Don't we all do this in this room pretty much? We start thinking, what else can we do, right? So going from there, the acellular graft, it's bovine, and it's, all the cells are removed, so you put an acellular graft, there's nothing in there. So it keeps the bacteria down. It reduces any uh, immune uh, reaction to it. And then, you know, it's preserved. You rehydrate it, and the bacteria contamination, because you're putting on your wounds, will actually create a nice field also so the infections don't get in the wound. And that's what we use the machine also with their back. But you can see what happens as they start to heal. You see new epithelium, and this is all good. There's nothing wrong with this. If you don't want to debride this, you don't want to debride that, because this is all new skin building up inside the wound. So when you see that, and typically when you're out and you're doing wound care, nurses like to wipe everything off and clean and say, now let's be free right again, get great. You're wiping away nice clean tissue. So sometimes you really know what you're looking at, even though this doesn't look super healthy, but it's really good, healthy stuff happening here. And then this is what we see when it heals, and it's still remodeling here, but you see this nice pink epithelial skin. This is still, you know, able to tolerate some forces. So it took about seven, eight grafts over eight months with all that same treatment we just talked about. So the pathology report, you know, is this considered regenerative medicine? If we knew back then that xenografts are regenerative medicine or not, right? 
So going back to 10 years ago, the pathology report says it right here, right there somewhere. It's dermal scar with regenerative changes with xenograft. So we took a little sample because we had to do another touch-up, and I sent it because I was curious to see what the pathology was to say after I did surgery. And what it came back as, hey, we see, what does that say? Regenerative changes. And it has xenograft. So they can confirm, is this an objective finding? Yes. Correct, right? But we have to always debate this, right? We're always debating objective, subjective, and I think we have to always remember those go hand in hand. Let me see if I can speed it up. So going back to why did we find out that this was Arunithia and General Project sent a sample to Scotland, and we got back and they find out that there's a glycine defect in the DNA producing asparagus acid, but if you look here, that gives her the confirmation of a TPR3 gene, which confirms that she has Olmsted syndrome, and but her son and her nephew do not have it. So she was relieved to find out, hey, I have something that we can actually diagnose now because of DNA testing. So think how far we come now with DNA testing. You know, now we can do this in our office, but back then I could. If I had this tool, which now we can send somebody to the U.S. and get a DNA testing, it's great. But I didn't have that, so we have to wait for the Utah place to actually send a sample to confirm that she had Olmsted syndrome. So she comes back and this is her report and it's 99% sensitive in detecting these sequences here. So again, objective data, right? And this is very specific sensitive and you can look at this next slide here. There's only seven cases that have been in the literature that are reported with genetic testing. So based on that project in Utah, they said do not write a literature, don't say you have PC, without testing for it, because we don't want people in the literature saying you have one case, and this is a great case study, a good write-up. They're saying, no, confirm it with DNA, with, with the genetic testing, and then actually write something and put it in the literature. So. Dr. Brandes, uh, what's your pain level like after this? Her pain level was excruciating in the beginning. Two years, she still had some episode of flare-up, which we're gonna go into now in about a minute, but she did have some pain. But then after we managed that, just letting the tissue keep regenerating, she actually just pain just went away, that's all. So if you look at it here, so going through this really quick, the study showed that there is some phenotype immunological conditions here with hyper-IG, and this is important. I mean, they found this in the peripheral blood that there was actually follicular T cell and, and confirming that these are all the genes that would relate to Olmsted syndrome. And this is done by Danso and Abim et al. in 2013. In this journal, the UFNF for rare diseases, you can find all the Olmsted, all these rare conditions are always gonna be in that journal for some reason, but they love that stuff. So, but there's good research being done. So your question there, Dr. Cole, was she, after seven years, she had no pain, right? Living a normal life. So every time I get another speaker, but living a normal life, wearing all the shoes, so I told her to behave, right? That's the first I said, you gotta treat this like crystal, I don't want you walking, I'm gonna make you some cushions for your feet. She abused them. She wore heels, she wore sandals, she got married, she had two kids, lived a normal life, and I was like, crossing fingers, I said, do not break down, right? But it shows me seven years later that these things have held up after doing several graphs, letting her just live a normal life, and it was a good way to test back. And that's objective data, right? She comes back and tells me all this, and I'm saying, you know, that's a miracle that she hasn't broken down, because she's not, she's coming in with sandals every time I see her. I mean, I'm not talking about sandals, I'm talking about those nice skinny ones that there's no cushion at all. I'm thinking, like, I'm glad these things are holding up. So anyway, let me speed up to get to the, the most important parts. Is, so there's no pain, but this is the episode. She comes back in 2016, and she's, you know, three years back, and she has no pain, but she's concerned that this might be coming back on the left foot. The right foot's still fine. But we still have these semi in the body, which are normal because, um, you know, bleeding. So, wouldn't you say she waited too long to come back? Well, she's come back several times. I just didn't want to use that for the talk and the purposes, but she always spot checked her, and she always emailed me, sent me pictures. Would you rather go smaller than that large? Well, the last last three years, yes, it would have been, but she had a baby, they live in Honduras, so it was kind of hard for me to travel on it, you know, so as long as they could get in touch with me, I was fine with that. Um, so we decided to, so, Basically, this is my setup in the office. But well, we talk about PRP and regenerative medicine here, but if you guys notice that a lot of patients have done research, right? Yeah. So they'll come in and they'll say, the key word for people that speak Spanish is that, oh, sell them out of these, they get excited. But they can say it in Spanish, that means stem cells, right? But we can't say it in English because now we can't say it. 
Uh, they can say it in Spanish. Maybe we can switch it to Spanish and they'll let us say it, right? So the amount of treatment is great. <laughs> Call it biologic. Hey, well, well, yeah, but we're going to go into that alabaster or... or right. Containing or stem cells. You have to put the biologic in them to contain... It reduces the oxidative damage factor with MDA. Uh, MMP9 is peaks at two weeks, and then you have decreased inflammation with cytokines at the two nerve passes one uh, beta, right, the TNF1. But you ever notice that this is key? How many people have done PRP and they wonder why they don't see a result in the first two weeks with a patient? And they're scratching their head just PRP alone? Because this has to go through a six-day uh, inflammation and it might hinder some of the healing. So it might be cytotoxic in the beginning, the body has to still clean it up. So as it's healing, then you start seeing effects two weeks after. And then you say it's working. Then you follow them three months and you see they're doing, doing better and it just starts getting better and better because the body's doing exactly what we're talking about when we talk about a lot of these lectures with PRP, exercise matrix, why things are working. So everything has to have a time to work. So sometimes the first six days to 14 days do not get discouraged if you just do PRP alone. This is why, because it can be a little cytotoxic for certain tissue and it does delay healing. So, and then this is from the lab that I use, Regen Lab. Again, I have no uh, disclosure, but again, all the platelets, all these nice growth factors, right? We know that we're talking about platelets, rich plasma, and Farida was talking about how to get it at four degrees, plasma has to be at 25, that's all good, but we wanna know is why is things working, right? So, neovascular effect, you know, why these things migrate, but the key here, stem cell migration, right? They can say it on the website, that's fine, I didn't say it, that's on their website, but I can still say it, I agree with that. And then here's what they did. They set a test, because the FDA said you need at least 60, they did 60 volunteers to meet the requirement, and they put it right here, and they tell you the study, and this is what they got. They got a higher than 80% yield, and they got all these other factors to measure out, and you can see a lot of this stuff is what we always keep talking about. So all you need is 10 mLs of blood to get about 5 mLs of leukocyte for PRP, which some people have to debate that too, but really PRP is what we're trying to look at. So this is for Nicole there, I know he's talking about what machines I use and all that, but here's what everybody's been asking, they want to know. So the machine already has a program. If you don't really want to do it yourself, you hit a button here five minutes later or nine minutes. You can double spin it or you can single spin it. And you're going to get, I mean, whether you double spin or single spin, it's 340 RPMs times 10 is what you're going to get, but this is their, their protocol. And when I spoke to them, when they came out in 2013, they were about in the States uh, a lot longer than, than uh, in Europe. I mean, when it came in the States, it was 2013, just about the time when I started doing uh, more regenerative medicine. And they told me literally when I said 1,500, and they said, if I, we spun it at 2,200, technically in five minutes, we'd break the glass. So we can't get it down. And they said, we're the Swiss technology, which you know, they make watches. And I say, that's a great selling point because you know they're really good with time. So if you can't spin it any faster, they will break the glass. So you want to get a good PRP, hit the button, walk away, come back, and, and then you want to see this. And then another question we get is, Yes, here's a tube, it has a coagulant in there, the anti-coagulant, I mean. You centrifuge it for five minutes, you see this product. You've got to just twist the tube a couple times and you'll get this uh, activated. So this layer here, everybody's trying to get with a needle, you're just going to plug into the agar and make it a mess. So if you just turn them side by side, it's going to kind of mix in and you extract everything out and you're going to get your 80% yield. And they did a study that uh, 1.6 is where their fold is. Anything above three can be cytotoxic. So getting so much concentration doesn't mean it's a good thing, as you've heard in other lectures, that PRP doesn't have to be super concentrated. You want to get about 1.6, and they've actually had studies to back that up. So everybody's own protocol. I just like to keep it simple and understand why things work. I've been using it for seven years. Things have worked. 90% of patients have done well, so why would I mess around with their, they've done all the research for me. Let me just use what they already know. So, and then you got to understand why it works. So, you know, this is just a quick video of, that's a little music, so it's not so boring. But. You're freehanding it, Yeah, I have to freehand. I used to use the kits, but this is where you can break down your cost. You can use an 18 gauge in a freehand, and you're fine. 10, 10 ml syringe gives you enough vacuum pressure that you don't even have to do anything. Sometimes it, you know, the pressure is so strong that they want to pull me back. So, I mean, you can do this with a 10 ml syringe. I mean, How many ml of blood that you do? 10 mls, and I get about five to six. Uh, MLs of PRP. If you go more, like 100 ml of blood, I think when you get more places, you can get more effect. Yeah, and just because the reason why I like their product is in the foot, I don't need a lot of volume. I mean, most times the ankle joint is five, six cc's is going to be enough for what I got to do. But if anybody wants more volume, you get bigger kits, you get you can do a lot more with it. But 
going back to what I was saying, that, so how do we inject this? You have to pepper technique. It doesn't matter if you're doing one tissue, Achilles tendon, grafts, or wound. I go around the outside, but you can see what I'm doing here, is I'm just going in the middle of, of the wound itself. So this is the revision that we did. So there's another graph, but I'm injecting in the graph and going into that. So I'm just going to speed through it. So why do we pick amnio allografts? So we all know that it's really growth factors, right? We're not going to say it's stem cells anymore, although 10 years ago everybody said you got stem cells, right? We have people walk through the door, we don't. We have to do our research to figure this out. Oh, now we're all saying it's growth factors, right? But in 2010, I mean 19. 10, in vivo, they had great success with grafts. They were using this that long ago. You're talking about over, you know, how many years already? You know, 100? So, and they tested in skin, in vivo, corneal ligaments, but they also did cardiac and that in animal models. So, here's the literature with dry allograft that showed that these are growth factors, but why not? You know, here it is again. These look familiar, right? Same thing, cytokines, fibronectin, laminin, collagen. This was also, we saw in PRP, we also saw this in other products. So, you're actually adding this, again, growth factors and other things that you're helping to heal. So, in the extracellular matrix in vivo, they migrated stem cells in vitro, they actually, and then they also recruited stem cells in vivo. And then again, the bioactive stuff, this all looks familiar again, right? All the growth factors, interleukins, all this is all good stuff that we're putting in there. Now, again, I have no bias. I use the real product, the BioD, and I've been using AJ's product, Alice, and I'm getting all the same results. So. PRP stays the same for me. I've played around with different algorithms and I have got all similar results for probably seven, eight years now with patients. And we have them do uh, surveys and, and I'll go into that in a minute. So the, the membrane is actually has, it's really a barrier for water, water insoluble material. So what it does, it keeps all this good stuff in there. And that was done by a study in Portugal. And then if you look here at that same study, if you look at just this little area here, it has pluripotent properties, anti-inflammatories, antivi antivirals, antibacterial, immunological characters that are antiallergenic and probiotic features, right? But the key is it promotes epithelialization and no tumors and it's ethically no problems, right? So if you hear something like that, and this is what they're doing in the research, it makes you feel at ease when you're doing treatments, right? So, and then in, in the literature for the orthopedic literature, you see it's plantar fasciitis, Tendinopoly, and even infusions, they've been using this in clinical trials. And then, you know, here's the new skin that we just did, the revision, and we see new skin again. But prior preserved, they're not. The most important thing you're stimulating is the paracrine response, right? The stem cells to promote tissue healing and repair. And then here's your paracrine response, which is cell to cell, so around here. And the most important thing, it is for the extracellular matrix to regulate. So whether you're using exosomes or whatever you're using, this is key to get this effect. So if you have the paracrine effect with these tissues, whether you use PRP and you're using uh, amnio products, or xenografts, so what happened is, you can see even here in the syringe that this is a plastic surgeon injecting the hand, that's my landlord, by the way, and we asked, he asked me, he still didn't believe in regenerative medicine, said, but if you believe in it, I'll do it for your patient. So here he is helping me out with this case, and I'm injecting the foot, but I'm gonna skip through this really quick because I want to get to this part. This is important, right? This is what I do with all my patients. They come in for follow-up, and here's what she says. Yes, after surgeries, the cellular monitor treatment. There's the cellular monitor. So she says that I didn't say it, it's not stem cells, it's cellular monitor. But yes, she would do this again. And then 10 years of no pain, she's able to have a normal life. It's been doing a lot of activity, like running, walking, swimming, and more than happy with her, satisfied with her treatment. So can I discard this data? How do we measure this patient's success, right? What they said they couldn't do, now they're doing. That's what we all do in this room. So can we just say subjective data is not important, right? And is this subjective data or this subjective data when you go to the ER? What do we call this? Our pain scale, right? But well, we accept this with open arms, right? As the gold standard in the industry, right? Everybody has that and we say, but nobody has a debate with this, right? But more importantly is here's her three years later and this is her now, which she's walking pain free, has this, but the most important thing is if you look here, 10 years ago, one application with PRP, amnio, in her hands, and the lesion's almost completely dissolved. And if I called the plastic surgeon and said, you need to come down and see something in my office, I didn't tell him what it was yet. When he saw that, I think he changed his mind about regenerative medicine. And that's so the most important. Surgery, right? 
Yeah, so this is just over the course of the time. Just to wrap this up, I really want to get to this last slide, but this is her when she couldn't move her toes and she couldn't move her hands for 10 years. So this is her after one treatment. So just the Just, yeah, and her hands, I mean, because it's not weight-bearing surface, you're going to get a better result. The feet are on, the, you know, on your feet. But that's her moving her hands and did it. So her, she, her face is, uh, you know, one hand application. She's uh, completely different. So let me go back here one second. So is this a treatment or a cure? Sometimes you can say the hand could have been a cure. I don't know yet because we have to see what she does long term. That's three years. Treatment, though, in the foot is going to be what I'm doing. I'm managing it. If it comes back, we degrade it. We'll do what we need to do. And the more we learn and the more new stuff comes out, she might have benefits with new products. But we are managing the disease, aren't we? So the most important thing is this is what we have to focus on, right? What is the goal in medicine? Are we improving the quality of life in our patients? And this is her email to me. One of the happiest patients in the world, better life, right? You can't get anything better. So whether they say tomorrow I can't use it, I can use it, at least for this, you know, this patient's life is going to change. So, and then here's one of my favorite quotes. And if you guys read that, you know what it says. If you treat a disease, you win, you lose. You treat a person, I guarantee you win, no matter what the outcome. And that was by Pat Chaz. You know, he's a little out there, but that's why he's yeah. some good quotes. But anyway, thank you guys.